Okay, so here's the view of the rear of the, uh, the control panel that we've just taken off. If you want to see how this is removed, then look at the other video. I think we'll do this in this one. This is the electronic design section. If you want to see how the uh, panel is removed, then have a look at the other video. So we'll just turn it over. I don't think that knob comes off. I just tried to leave it off and it won't come off. So I'm guessing it just is captive in the control panel, but we'll find out, won't we? So remove these two screws, I think. Pretty straightforward this, I think. If you can't work this out, then uh, you should be able to. <laughs> Obviously, this is a mains powered piece of equipment, so uh, don't power this up out of the case unless you know what you're doing. I don't take responsibility for people doing daft things. Right, so does that. Okay, so I've removed the screws. You can see there's these clips here. There's one clip there which I think we need to release, so let's just release that clip. Or maybe not actually. That clip stays. That clip stays. It's this clip, I think. And presumably one somewhere else. Is there any more? There is definitely something holding it in. Is it the knob? It's not the knob. It must be one at this end. Yeah, here's a clip at this end. So pull it out of that clip. There we go. They love their clips, don't they, these people? Another one here. So that's three clips we've released. Any more for any more? Can't see any more. But still, she refuses to budge. Oh, look, more screws. Everyone's shouting at the screen. You've left them screws in. Well, now I'm taking them out. This is a voyage of discovery. I haven't done one of these before, so uh, I'm going to have to cut me some slack. And my clips have just clipped back in, as they are prone to do. Screws out. Put them in the pot. Will it come now? One more screw. Nice and clean and very little dust in the machine. I fancy it hasn't been used very much. Certainly a lot of gubbins back there. So let's try loosening these clips again. See if we can get them to stay off this time. There we go. And then the third one along here. And then the fourth one. And will she come free now? Yes, she will. So the knob is captive. There has to be aligned correctly. You can see the rotation of that shaft's got a flat on it, so uh, that's that. So we can move that out of the way. It's got a trombone work of uh, optical uh, light pipes to uh, carry the indicators from the back of there down the base of these holes. And so, oh, what over engineered or what? Okay, so let's move the panel out of the way because we don't need that anymore and have a look at this. We'll concentrate on this. These knobs, this knob assembly. Interesting how that's slanted, isn't it? You see that's slanted in there? I'm not quite sure whether something has come adrift, but let's just take this off. Two clips. Any more clips? No. Uh, or is there? Somewhere down this end there's a clip. Or it's just caught on something. There we are. So that just lifts off. Give that a bit of a clean. So put them to one side. We don't need that anymore. Not what we're doing. The light pipe, is that loose? No, the light pipe seems to be captive at the moment, so I don't think there's a chance of losing that, but you never know. And then more screws. And we'll see whether it's the usual suspect has caused this to fail. Two more screws in the pot. There we go. Screws and clips. I'll come out with the tweezers or not. No, it's unscrewed, but it won't come out, so I'm going to have to pull it out. 
don't lose that screw. So I take the screw out and store it in the pot. Okay, another cover over there in the cover file. And here we have the, uh, the electronics. Okay, so let's take the electronics board out. I can see another screw. Screw, 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 screw. Clip, clip down this end. Uh, clip up here. I suppose you'd call them clips, wouldn't you? And a clip down the end there. What's stopping this coming out now? Is it just that clip, do you think? Yep, so let's resume with this. It's got to be this one down here. It's got to be this one down here. It's causing us the grief at the moment. So a bit of leverage on there. And another tool back into the tweezers to remove that clip from there. To push that back out of the way. It's quite a toughie actually. One of us will lift up from this end. It won't lift up from this end because these are all engaged in the slots along the front. These uh, these tongues on the board are actually engaged, so we're still. I'm looking for another screw, but I can't find one. I think on this side. So it's just got to be that clip being all put down there. Tough one to get back because it hits the sidewall before it disengages. I think I might have got it there. Yeah, it is that clip that's doing it. Try again. So I'm, I'm levering a little bit there to, uh, it's a bit tricky. There we are. Bit on the tricky side. They didn't want that to fall out, did they? Okay, so now we've got the actual main housing. We can get rid of that. Okay, let's have a quick look at the controller, what we've got here. We've got the mains input on the back of the main rotary switch here. We've got a power comes into this resistor with a filter capacitor. This is usually a 47 or 33 ohm resistor. It's just to stop the inrush current surge to here. When you hit the power, um, it charges this capacitor up, which is a EPCOS 22 microfarad, 400 volt capacitor. That's the main high voltage reservoir capacitor. That thing can store some charge, so if you're playing around with this, you need to discharge that after you've disconnected the power, otherwise you could be poking around and there could be a significant voltage on that afterwards. It's uh, like a small battery, I suppose you could think of it like that, but it's uh, a lot more than that really. So it comes through here, uh, rectifiers? Anyway, it goes through this resistor, through a rectifier. This capacitor is the high voltage shot. If on, on UK mains at 240, it would be something like 360 volts on this capacitor. And then down to here, we've got some opto-isolators for uh, reporting back the voltage between the secondary safe side and the actual offline switching side, which is this. So offline switching power supply, there's the coil. The transformer or coil, you've got one, two, three connections on the input side, and then one coming out down there to a rectifier diode down there. So this is the actual HV side going in. Yeah, so I think that's just an offline um, power supply coil. There's the barrister to um, absorb any voltage transients to help protect the electronics if you get some volts above the normal standard supply voltage range coming down your mains and blowing up your controller. And then if we look on the back of here, oh yeah, we've got a control chip. Oh, I can instantly see a stain just here can you see that where it's blown it's uh the magic smoke has been released in a puff and taken out some debris with it if we just zoom in on that and there you have it there's the actual chip and we don't really need to look any further 
because this is clearly blown you can see there's a little crater of fissure on the top can you see that with well, a little bit of stuff has come out it's an LNK 304 GN GN means this package it's uh, a devil of a chip if you see it change it it's my my motto if I open up a piece of equipment it's got one of these in this has been through several revisions of the die uh, by power integrations people that make it uh, to make it more reliable there's several application notes which are have been released since probably when this was designed about making sure the power supply is reliable. Clearly this is a chip which is standing in the middle of the uh, transient high voltage motorway waiting to be mowed down by a transient and they don't last, they age and we have them in amplifiers, we have them in bedside lights, we have them in washing machines, tumble dryers, cookers. Lots of people use this power integration chips because you just need a coil um, reservoir capacitor, a shocky, fast shocky diode to rectify the uh, flyback from the offline uh, buck regulator and the secondary reservoir capacitor. So with very few components you can make a DC power supply that provides 12-15 volts up to a couple of hundred milliamps um, directly from a main supply. So minimal amount of components all in here but you know, this pin here has got 400 volts or 360 volts going into it on UK mains and they age and if you see it for 90 cents or a pound probably, just do yourself a favour and just put a new one in, uh, which is what I do. But this one obviously needs a new one anyway because this is the guts of the chip that have been blown out. I don't know if we can see the fissure in the side or not, it's coming, that's come from underneath isn't it? So what I'll do is I'll dig one of these out focus you focusing thing I'll dig one of these out and I'll show you how to change it not with a hot air gun but with a soldier line to give you a chance of doing it yourself okay so let's let's um I'll just set up for that and I'll be back and we'll change the chip normally before I uh, change any components I would normally test this but there is no point because this is burnt out you can see it has got fissures and the gases come out as I said but there are a few things that are worthy of checking. Normally in these circuits there is a something like a 33 ohm resistor in series with the power supply. So that, and what happens is if there's a catastrophic short on here, these resistors blow open circuit and act as a fuse. And if we just look to check this one now, Put it on ohms and then check across this resistor. Uh, yeah, we've got overload basically. It's open circuit that resistor, so if we have a closer look at it, we might be able to see why. So there's that resistor we were just checking. Let's uh, have a look at it. Yeah, look, it's cracked. Sometimes this uh, coating is blown clean off. See, it's cracked there. You can see it's all melty, melty inside. See? It is screwed. <laughs> it's melted, and the heat has, uh, the gases have blown the wires open. So that's a, a non resistor. And uh, can we tell what it is? For, you can just see it. Can you see that there? For, 47 ohm. 5%, probably a 2 watt wire wound. Now you've got to be careful, if you change this for a, a beefier resistor that doesn't blow open circuit, then you can end up with nasty effects, you know, in terms of if it doesn't go open circuit when required to do so, you can end up with uh, a lot more power going into the system. And it kind of acts as a fusible resistor. I can't see a discrete fuse on this board. No, there's no discrete fuse. So that is a resistor and a fuse. It just so happens that they blow open circuit when you put mains across them. Right, so we've got to find a 47 ohm wire wound 2 watt, 2 and a half watt resistor from somewhere. And again, we've got to change this chip. Okay. So I'm going to sort those parts out and then we'll get on to it. But there's no point plugging this in at this stage because it is clearly screwed at the moment. And it's a very, very common fault. And if you've got a washing machine or a tumble dryer or something which has got no power, no lights on on the, you know, the light, nobody's there, nothing's happening, there's no um, LEDs or power indicators, nothing's happening then, it's always worth opening them up. And usually if it's Siemens, Neff, 
or um, Bosch or Candy, um, they've got one of these chips in and it usually is this chip that's blown but always check that resistor. Again, don't plug this in um, to the mains, it's got some lethal voltages on here unless you know what you're doing. Right, so I'm just going to get those bits together and we'll change them. Yeah, and there's a close-up view of that device look and you can see it's erupted through a little Vesuvius on top. You can see there's a mark there and all this stuff has been blown out, the package being vaporized and then sprayed onto the board. So if you see the power integrations device, <laughs> change it. Um, they're a widespread perpetration of uh, bad design and if you look at the power integrations website these devices have gone through several iterations of die also with several application notes on how to design better more reliable power supplies using this chip of course these boards were probably designed before they discovered the reliability issue and um, maybe the engineers haven't read the um, product updates and the bulletins to optimize the reliability they are, to be fair, connected to the mains. They do age. If you see an LNK, 301, 302, 304, 306, then change it. Because they do age, and um, next year you'll be back in there to change the chip if it was another reason that caused the fault. So the things in this chain are, we've seen this resistor already has been blown, okay? Um, open circuit. Wire wound resistor acting as a fuse and an inrush limiter to stop the high inrush current going in through the diode into the reservoir capacitor. And there's this diode here, which is an SM516, which is a 1 amp 1400 volt PIV peak inverse voltage diode. And I guess we ought to, as well as resistor, we ought to change, check that one as well. <clears throat> so I go on to diode continuity. If enough current went through the resistor to blow the resistor up, it may be that this diode is damaged. No, the diode is good. Look, we've got 600 millivolts, which is about what you expect for a silicon diode. So the diode has survived. So it's this, the resistor on the other side, and there's a lot of ancillary components around here, but I'm hoping that they're not damaged. We'll get into that if the thing doesn't work after we change this chip, all right? So I'm going to show you how to change this chip, the LNK device. I've only got the 302 in stock, which is a slightly lower power version, but I've looked at this board and there's nothing on this board which would uh, make a 302 not work. There's not enough current being drawn, and I would replace with the 304, but I think the earlier ones had 302s on anyway, and they've, as an attempt to try and make the thing more reliable, they've tried the more powerful, more robust device. But of course, it's, uh, it's not current that's destroying these, it's voltage. So, how do you get this chip off? There's two ways of doing it, um, depending on the power of your soldering iron. If you're doing this as a repair at home, um, you need a modern soldering iron that's uh, capable of 400 degrees Celsius. A lot of the older irons used to be designed to run on um, th roughly about 320 uh, degrees, 330, for the old tin lead solder, this stuff. 60% tin, 40% lead. And it m melts much lower, it's much more workable, much more pleasant. So I do my rework with a little bit of tin lead solder because it's not very much. If you consider you're keeping the whole machine out of landfill just for the sake of a few spots of leaded solder, it's just easy to use. Now, there's two ways of doing this with um, without a hot air gun. Obviously, I've got this thing, this thing here, which blows hot air and you can use it as a electric blow lamp, I suppose, but it's temperature controlled and you can melt the solder and lift the, uh, lift the component off with the tweezers. Here's the tweezers, and uh, just pull it off. So, to remove this and not damage the PCB, bear in mind this is an FR port, there's a fiberglass FR4 high grade uh, um, circuit board, whereas this is a laminate sort of uh, cellulose cardboard laminate board which is much cheaper but not as strong so if you start pulling around on this it's going to pull the tracks off and you don't want that okay so 
there are two methods. I'm going to, I don't know which method to demonstrate to you today, actually. Um, you can get a very fine pair of cutters like this. You can see they're very fine tip. These are about $5 a pair on Banggood, and they're very good. What brand name are they? U-Star. And I've been using these. I've got several pairs of these because I keep losing them. And I keep using them for things I shouldn't do, you know. But... Um, yeah, nice fine tip on them, and you can just get hold of these legs like that. I'll do one of them so you can see. You give it a little snip like that, then you turn your soldering iron on, and then chat away about nothing at all while the soldering iron heats up. Oh, well, here you go, look, you can see this better. So put the cutters on there, snip. You can see I'm just going to grasp that part there, focus you focusing thing. And snip, snip the leg off, and then get your soldering iron and just pick the leg off the pad. All right. So you can go around and do one after the after the after the other and do the whole chip like that, or you can use this method, which I'll show you now, which is uh, an easy method too. So let's put that back in the centre of the picture. There we are. So you get a bit of copper, wire, copper wire. I've got one mil diameter copper wire. This stuff. Just plain old copper, lovely old copper, and we just really literally just bend it into a rectangle to go around the chip. Something, something like, something like that. Let's just snip it off. There we are. So she's lying around the chip, and we just get some. Solder wire and a soldering iron. As I say, you need probably 400 degrees. You need a decent soldering iron, 60 watt at least, with a decent, you know, a quality one. Whereas the Chinese ones tend to have all sorts of weird metals as the uh, soldering tip. And once you start to draw the heat out, you can't get your 60 watts out the tip. You can get 60 watts into the iron, but having 60 watts going in the iron is no good if you can't pull 60 watts in heat out of the tip because the thermal conductivity between the tip and the element is uh, insufficient. So you just give this a bath all the way around. Of course we've taken the leg off that one already but you'd normally have the leg on there as well. And then you just make sure everything is connected. It's a little bit smoky so don't get over it and don't inhale too much. Be like Bill Clinton, just don't inhale. And then you can see it's all moving. And you just grab hold of the chip with the tweezers. Here we come. And lift her off. And there you've got it. Now, soldering this back on, I would normally use this braid, this stuff. This is solder braid. It's a, called solder wick. And it acts like a, a piece of uh, blotting paper, if you like. It's the thin capillary action. The solder has very high surface tension. And the capillary action is... Uh, draws these actual molten liquid solder directly into the into the uh, into the wick. And you can see this is wicked up here. It's just like blotting paper basically or even tissue paper when you spill something in the kitchen. What you can do is to use your soldering wipe it off with the solder. Like that. So a piece of tissue and through with the iron. And wipe it off. I mean, I would use a solder braid, as I said, but if you don't have any, you can use this method. Works pretty well. And also, keeping your iron clean as well, because um, if I just keep wiping the iron, and keep touching that pad, you can see as I wipe the solder off the iron tip, when I put the iron tip back on, the solder flows around the smooth tip of the iron. So just by doing that a few times, you can get to a point where it's flat enough to solder the new component on. So wipe the tip, and as you do it, the solder on the pad will migrate to the flat surface, flat clean surface of the tip, and then thus removing the solder from the pad. Okay, it's not the best way of doing it. I'll just demonstrate the actual so you can see it's pretty flat. That's flat enough to solder on, but I'll show you how the wick works if you're interested. 
as you just uh, touch on melt be careful because if it solders on and you pull it off see it's a little bit flatter but the other method with the iron is perfectly good now uh, to clean this up we use usually use isopropyl alcohol some people have said can you use acetone I'd say no it's too aggressive there we are lovely nice lightly brushing motion with the wife's toothbrush and things will become clear and clean right new chip okay if you can get the 304 get the 304 there's no 304s in stock in the UK at the moment except in large quantities so I checked so I'm gonna put a 302 on because I know I've designed prow supplies with these in to my shame <laughs> for people who wanted a quick and dirty design I would never use them normally but they use them all over the place and I've come across these everywhere and they're a repair engineers dream 40 or 50 quid for changing a chip basically that's worth 90p can you imagine well now you can do it yourself can't you buy yourself so spend your 40 quid on a soldering iron have some soldering fun and satisfaction too so uh, yeah so we're gonna melt the solder you can see nice clean tip no one likes a dirty tip we're going to melt the solder onto the tip and the pad. And you can see I haven't dislodged the chip. Soldered. See? Now I'll do the one on the other side. Now that the chip is kind of fixed down. Note you can't put this on the wrong way around because there's a pin missing between the high voltage and the low voltage side. That one. It's that one there. And now this one here, you little buggers. There we are, lovely. Ah, what could be finer? A cup of coffee, a soldering iron, and a webcam. If you do use the, um, if you do fix this using my video and you found it useful, I'd be very uh, pleased to hear because I get loads and loads of views and quite a few likes, but no comments. And I, beavering away on in this room on my own. And, uh, yeah, lacking a bit of social contact, actually. I talk to the dog a lot, but, you know, to be honest with you, she's not really into much except tennis balls. And then you have to be a bit of a dog whisperer to work out what the hell she wants. But it's to go out, play ball, a stroke, something to eat, a walk. She just won't tell me. I've tried. Mind you, I've had partners like that, not great communicators. Right, so the chip is in. That's how you do the chip, all right? So now we've just got to whip this resistor out. Now I've got another problem as well, which I have to admit, is that I don't have a wire wound resistor, okay? Now, the reason I use wire wound in this situation is that um, wire, wire, wound, bleh, wire wound resistors will go crack when you over, grossly overload them. You can see this one's got all its pubes sticking out. When you overload them, they go pop. And uh, yeah, there's no drama. There's no nasty smell. No fumes. No flares. No fire. And uh, often no indication that they've gone crap inside them. So this is a 47 ohm. I think, I said before it was a 2 watt. I think it's a 2.5 watt, judging by um, the dimensions of the others. It doesn't actually say on it, I don't think. Let's whip it out and see if it actually says the, the rating. So hold on to the tweezers. Grab hold of the wire melt it and then fail miserably to get it out no she's there she comes baby right so what's this little blighter's uh th three watt there you go so it's a three watt so i tell you what that's chinese because all the three watt ones i'm bound to find uh the bodies are bigger than this so it's a Chinese three watts, which is a uh, English unit watts is probably two and a half, but don't tell anyone. The Chinese think we don't know. Anyway, uh, so keep that quiet. Yeah. So what can we do? We can. Uh, I could use the alternative are things like. Um, I have got some four. Here we are. 
Here's a 47 ohm 2 watt carbon resistor. Now these were used widely in the past and uh, in fact this came out of a box that I have electronic stuff that I had when I built an oscilloscope for my metalwork project in 19... don't listen to this... 1976 and uh, it's a 2 watt carbon resistor 47 ohm. Um, now compared to that, <clears throat> you can see the difference in size that's the 3 watt mind you, this is 2 watt. This is a block of carbon and if we... I might do that in the next video actually. Just put some power on this and just see the red hot nasty smoking fireball incendiary device that you can create with one of these. So clearly we can't put one of those back in because it would be a risk. It would catch fire and uh, instead of blowing open circuit it would go into probably a carbon arc and you can imagine all that entails wasn't such a bad, you know, the old valve stuff in the old days used to catch fire and smoke and selenium rectifiers fires and your telly used to fail and make the room smell like a herd of cows have farted in your living room. You know, it was, uh, electronics was a smelly business, but now it's not acceptable for smoke to come out, so that's no good. But we will demonstrate that in another video because it's very entertaining. Uh, this one's gone, I don't have a replacement for it, so... At the moment, I would. I'm. I've just ordered a stock of these, and also I ordered a stock of the chips as well. The correct chips have been ordered. So if you uh, and we supply these on a non-profit making basis. I've got an office which we do professional audio repairs, and upgrades and Bluetooth upgrades and things like that. And this, these are just on the shelf in the stock room, ready to be picked, and for a couple of quid we'll send you some out, save you going for all the rigmarole. So there it is, you want to fix yours and you want the resistor and you want that couple of quid on eBay and we'll post some out to you. They post every day and it's not profit making. I make my money from YouTube, all right? So, and also the satisfaction of uh, fixing stuff which would otherwise be thrown away or completely denied or disavowed by the, uh, by the manufacturer. Yeah, so what we're going to put in instead. So at the moment we need some sort of 47 ohm three watts uh, resistor I don't think it could be three watts couldn't it it's unlikely to be three. if this whole controller takes five ten watts then there's only be a very small voltage drop across this so in operational mode this is can only be two or three hundred milliwatts you know because you're at mains voltage and so there's only a 20 milliamps or something going down here so really this has been chosen as a three watt for its fusing uh, it's fusing performance. Now, the alternative to those are, if I can find some somewhere, metal film resistors. Let me just sort a couple of metal film resistors out and have a look. Right, so I've got 47 ohm, uh, 47, yeah, 47 ohm, uh, one watt resistor. And I, these are metal film. These will explode, but not so easily as the as these. These will go crack. You probably hear a noticeable bang and a slight puff of smoke, but they won't catch fire generally. So, but I would advise you to get hold of the crack part. I'm putting this one in there just to demonstrate the actual repair. But if you can uh, get the right resistor, and as I say, I will get some and I will list them on eBay as I do with all, most of my repair videos. Um, at a few quid and literally um, I think it costs by the time we pack and process it and put the postage stamp on and pay for the postage there isn't very much in it at all or nothing in it for us at all it's just um, part of the ethos of the channel and also to support my YouTube activities my clandestine YouTube activities rather than my design activities right so uh, to be honest, I enjoy repairing stuff and putting, sticking one in the eye of the manufacturer the, more than I do actually uh, doing the design work. Because the design work is much harder. And I'm tired of it. I've been doing it for 40 years. Right, so I'm going to stick him in there. But I will, before I put this back together, I will replace it for the real, real deal um, when they come in. I've just ordered a bunch of them. They'll be taking a, hopefully not the slow boat from China. Where did we go there? I just soldered that in, you didn't even see it. There it is. So we soldered her in. 47 ohms going in. Right, so quick 
Right, a quick recap. Where are we? Let's just zoom out so you can see what we're doing. Check this resistor for resistance. I'm uh, gonna check that diode, although I'm not quite sure where that is in the circuit. Now, there's the buck coil. Check this capacitor looks nice and round and straight and parallel, and there's no doming at the top because if this is brewed up, you'll get this is these these lines on the top are intended. The old capacitors in my day used to just explode and scare the life out of you, and obviously take your eye out if you're not careful as the can launched its way upwards but um these have got a they're, they're crimped through here they're almost cut through so that when they fail they boil up inside and they um this can break open rather than the can explode and also you'll find that often the rubber blung in the bottom has been extruded so the thing might be sitting high off the board so have a good look at that and if they overheat sometimes this plastic sleeve identification sleeve can crack or wither or show signs of melting but they are pretty good these days they had a plague in the 90s and the noughties but epcos is a good brand if it's a genuine epcos i mean it's in china so it's got epcos on the label so all you can be sure about of chinese capacitor is it says the ink says epcos and it's ink <laughs> that's all um yeah and on the back we've got this uh series rectifier diode this sm416 which you could replace with any diode um, you know, 1400 volt PIV one amp silicon rectifier diodes, only mains frequency. Um, just check that hasn't gone short because it's in the chain of uh, destruction. All right, so let's uh, let's brush all the bits and pieces off the bench, to make sure there's nothing to short anything out. Right. On this connection, when I turn it on, is uh, 220 230 volts AC, and it is delivered to my bench by a isolation transformer which is a bit safer than directing connecting directly to the mains um, so if you do plug this in make sure you know what you're doing if you're going to do it naked on the bench like this then be warned go and take a degree or an electrical engineer or a technician's course in electronics before you curtail your life basically which is not a good idea. So this is completely dead before, we know that. We've got the chip in, we've checked everything, we're all okay. I think the selector switch is probably not on at the moment, so let's turn it over that way. Stand by for a bang. Okay, so nothing spectacular, but that's not surprising it's not turned on yet. I think a Phillips screwdriver, one of these things, will go in because it's got three little tabs on the inside of that hole and I think you can turn it one of these. So I'm going to hold it there on my fingers but away from anything live. Yeah. There it goes. Look, she's alive. Can you see that? Got the LEDs on. The LEDs are on. Yep. And you heard it peep as well. So yeah, it's come back to life. It's, I'm pretty confident. I've repaired enough of these things to know it's working. Yeah, so that's it, babe. Basically, a very simple. I know you have got nothing connected to you, are you, poor controller? Yeah, so it's running. It's working. I'm going to get the correct resistor, stick it in there. I want to release this video, really, to be honest, because I don't like having it in the, in the can for too long. And if you like that, then um, good luck with yours. If you want any help, if you want the bits... Um, I can sort you out, or the guys at the office will sort you out, <laughs> it's my company. And uh, yeah, there's a little subscribe button down there, if you can press that, if you enjoyed the video, and leave me a like if you like a like, because um, I like like. Okay, well take care, and good luck with yours if you're fixing one.